Hello everyone, this video deals with uh, Lecture 2 Lilies of Queen's Gardens from Sesame and Lilies by John Ruskin. John Ruskin is one of the most prominent writers of the 19th century in Britain. Sesame and Lilies is a collection of two lectures by Ruskin which he delivered at Manchester in 1864. The book has a symbolic title. The term sesame is taken from the story of the robber's cave from the Arabian Nights, where the robbers use the word sesame to open the cave. The first lecture is titled Of King's Treasuries. is about authors and reading. The second term that is lilies is taken from Isaiah from the Bible, which signifies beauty, purity and peace. The second lecture is titled Of Queen's Gardens. In this lecture, Ruskin deals with a woman's innate qualities, education and responsibility. Ruskin says that the purpose of education is to help the learner to acquire the power to reduce the suffering in society and also to promote uh, human welfare. Ruskin says that a woman should play a leading part in guiding and correcting men whenever they go wrong. His view confirms the old saying, behind every successful man there stands a woman. Ruskin searches the literary world of Britain, Greece and Rome to find illustrations of woman's wisdom and power to guide man and make the world a happy and healthy garden. He argues that both well-directed moral training and well-chosen reading can lead men and women to have kingly and queenly power over others who are badly guided and illiterate. According to Ruskin, man is mistaken in believing that a woman is only the shadow and attendant image of her husband or a slavish servant who needs his strength and courage to support her. Ruskin turns to the plays of Shakespeare to prove his view that women have the wisdom and the virtue to lead and save men from fatal errors. Also he says that Shakespeare has no heroes, he has only heroines. According to Ruskin, the male characters in the plays of Shakespeare have some kind of defect except the slight sketch of Henry V. Even the brave Othello fails to be heroic as he is easily deceived. So in every play we find matchless women in the plays of Shakespeare like Cordelia, Desdemona, Isabella, Hermione, Imogen, Queen Catherine, Perdita, Sylvia, Viola, Rosalind, Helena and Virginia. Tragedy in every play in, the, in Shakespeare is due to man's folly or error. Even King Leo fails in his life because of his own pride. Emilia, Desdemona's attendant, is more sensible than Othello. Juliet's brave plan is ruined by Romeo's recklessness. Women in Winter's Tale and Cymbeline stand for wisdom and patience. The purity of a woman is shown in measure for measure through Isabella. The only weak woman character in the plays of Shakespeare is Ophelia, who fails to guide Hamlet when he went wrong. There are only three wicked women characters in the plays of Shakespeare. They are Lady Macbeth, Regan and Gondril. Now Ruskin turns to Scott's novel, that is Walter Scott's novel, and he says that uh, there are only three uh, heroic men. Most of the women like Ellen Douglas have grace, kindness and dignity. It is these women who watch over, teach and guide men. It is never the other way round. Now he looks at the women in Greek and Roman literature. 
in dante's divine comedy it is the dead woman who saves her man from hell and leads him to paradise after teaching him the most difficult truths divine and human in another italian poem a knight writes to his lady expressing his gratitude for turning him from a wild beast into a man among greek women ruskin refers to andromache hector's wife the wise wisdom of cassandra a prophetess nausica a princess penelope the faithful wife of ulysses antigone the devoted daughter of oedipus iphigenia the obedient daughter of agamemnon and acestis the self sacrificing wife at wife of admetus turning back to england ruskin says that chaucer wrote a legend of good women but no legend of good men spencer's knights in the fairy queen are sometimes deceived or conquered but the soul of yuna is never darkened and britomart's spear is never broken the ancient egyptians depicted the spirit of wisdom as a woman it was again a princess who was chosen by god to raise moses the symbolic spirit of wisdom became the goddess adina ruskin wants the reader to see how knowledgeable people have viewed women's worth from ancient times he asks the question whether these people are wrong or whether the fault lies with us when we consider women to be inferior to men chivalrous knights used to obey the commands of their ladies since they believed that the armor of the soul could not protect them unless a woman's hand fortified it a man might ask how he could reconcile the wise guiding of an inspiring lady with the submissive role of a wife he wants every man to realize that we are foolish when we say that one gender is superior to the other each of them has something which the other does not have they complement each other feminists today find fault with ruskin when he dwells on different roles men and women have to play according to ruskin the man's power or function is active progressive and defensive he is eminently the doer the creator the discoverer the defender he goes on to say that man's intellect is for speculation and invention his energy for adventure for war and for conquest wherever war is just whenever conquest necessary he makes it clear that the woman's power is for rule not for battle and her intellect is not for invention or creation but for sweet ordering arrangement and decision it is the man who does all kinds of rough work out in the world the feminist is likely to dub ruskin a male chauvinist when he says that by her office and place she is protected from all danger and temptation ruskin has his own views on female education which could prepare her for her queenly role she needs the physical exercise that will keep her fit and improve her beauty he quotes passages from two poems of wordsworth to show the source of the girl's growth in a free environment while he advocates equal education for women he is careful to say what kind of books she is to avoid reading she does not need to be a specialist in any field or what he calls a dictionary she should have general education and sufficient knowledge to help men avoid doing wrong things he feels that a woman should avoid the study of theology which he terms one dangerous science for women since it is a field where even the greatest men have trembled and the wisest erred 
it is here that his prejudice seems to come to the surface in a glaring manner. However, he realizes the fact that the desire for power is deeply rooted in the heart of every man and every woman. The power, he asserts, a woman should have is to heal, to redeem, to guide and to God, and not to destroy with the lion's limb and the dragon's breath. This kind of power turns truly educated women into queens. The feminist reader, before, renown, uh, before denouncing Ruskin as a patriarch, must see that the Victorian age had conflicting images of womanhood. For middle class readers, the angel in the house written by Coventry Patmore remained the ideal for women who needed male protection against temptations and vices of the world. Academic education was viewed with suspicion by many men who thought that it was detrimental to women's health and reproductive capacity. It was in this context that Ruskin wanted women to be treated equally at home and in the academia. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening. Do subscribe, Renjulate.